I'm just going to jump on things. So, Mumbai. Investor protection. <coughs> Actually, very high. Out of 65 cities, Mumbai ranks 26. Financial services network. Numbers, I should say, I'm sorry, that the numbers on the left are the rankings of the, of the overall city. So I just threw in 19. I didn't put all the, the, the other 18 on top and the rest. And then here, number 17. That's a very high ranking. If you look at total value in equities trading, I don't know if people, if that is visible, this second one here, Mumbai ranks number 16, very high. Corporate tax burden, number 53. That's close to the bottom. That means a very high corporate tax. You understand that's negative from the perspective. So then my question is, where does all that money go? All that tax, that is. And then we have other low rankings from Mumbai. Quality of life. And I wish that some of that corporate tax burden would go into this. Very low, as you can see. You can see the other groups of cities. Now, maybe interesting is that Beijing is <laughs> right above Mumbai. It doesn't rank very high either. Basic services. No. Health and safety. No. Now, I want to remind people that I started out with a few slides that showed Mumbai as a very significant global financial center and capable of collecting a lot of corporate tax. So in that contrast, I want to put this. Now, number of commodity contracts, Mumbai ranks number six in the world. That's very significant. Financial flow dimension, how money, the ease with which, behind each of these stands a lot of very concrete issues. The ease with which money comes in and out, you know, very high. These are very high rankings because, you know, there are powerhouses that are involved. Now, ease of doing business drops very low, number 60. Ease of starting a business, not easy, number 54. In other words, with financial issues, Mumbai is ranked in a totally different category than this other dimension. So ease of starting a business is pretty difficult, but it's even more difficult to close a business. Now, you know, there are, again, there is all kinds of stuff behind this that explains it. I like this one, since you opened one of them. Not, it ranks very high. You can see that, right? Number of five-star hotels. Um, volume of commercial real estate. We all know. Now, here what I also find interesting is the group of cities with which it is. You know, you, you see that. Some Mexico City, uh, uh, what is it, the one that, they, they, you know, several cities where you have a lot of real estate, but the diversity of the cities involved is also astounding. That it is something that is cutting across very diverse types of cities. And I couldn't help but get at this. The Google hits, you know, there is actually data on. And Mumbai is somewhere in the middle. And the cities that rank at the top, it actually is very, very interesting to see what are the cities that catch people's imagination. But again, I thought it was interesting to see the group of cities within which Mumbai fits there. And um, anyway, yeah, so it's a whole sort of global perspective. Now, I want to, to conclude by coming back to this question of the character of these global cities today. First point, the number has grown. And I would say there was a first phase in the 1980s when the global economy is taking off and a few cities emerge as very significant. The 90s, an explosion in the number of countries that opened up, that deregulated, and the global city is this intermediate link between globalization and very specific national economies. I think that today, we are entering a third phase, which is a kind of thin capillary network where smaller and smaller places get articulated with the global economy. In a way, we have now, through these global cities, an infrastructure for the running, the managing, the debugging, etc., of global economic operations. The other side of the global city, the politics. 
the dynamics of global cities produce a democratic deficit. Mind you, that's not the only thing producing a democratic deficit. There are a few other variables at work. But this is truly a puzzle in terms of how do we govern these cities so that questions of economic justice, distribution of benefits, can be assured, at least to some extent. Finally, for the city itself, to have this maldistribution of income is a significant loss. It is much better for a city to have the largest share of its income going to a middle class, a modest middle class. Because that modest middle class is far more likely to spend its money in the city rather than a top 20% of very rich people that can send their money anywhere. I don't know if people notice the signs, or I notice the signs on the buses here in Mumbai that say Indians now can invest overseas, etc., at least $200,000. No. I mean, the modest middle classes don't have $200,000 to invest overseas, but they have money that they spend in the city. So, there is something very exciting about this economic era for cities, and there is something really challenging, which has to do, I think, with the political side of the matter. The economic side needs to be governed a bit more, I think, than it is right now. I thank you very much.